<laughs> well, thanks, thanks for that, Gary. I, uh, I didn't expect to hear something like that, but, but it's true. I'm, I'm involved with Global Dreams, and uh, you know, I've been working on CDG for uh, quite a while, it seems. <laughs> uh, 20 years, maybe, maybe a little bit more. Um, anybody who was at the uh, Doctors in uh, session yesterday, I hope, had an ample opportunity to realize that we all have to work together. So it's the researchers, it's the physicians, and it's the families. And all of us together, we all need each other. I mean, that's really important to understand. In the long run, we can't get anywhere without research. In the short run, you have to have your kids taken care of. And in the intermediate run, for scientists, we have curiosity, but we also have heart and commitment to helping you. So it's finding all of that balance that we need to go forward with. So what I'm going to try to talk about today, and to give you a little bit of a sense of, is kind of how this process works, where it comes from, how we do it in, in our lab. And I, and I call this uh, CDG discovery diagnosis and outreach because you know you may be thinking, well, why do I have to do a blood sample? What's, what's this stuff about skin? I mean, why do I have to do the skin? And who's this person coming along swabbing my cheek? You know, with uh, all these different things. Well, what does that mean, and why do we need to do this? So I'll do this by talking about what our, our lab's goals are, the sort of entry points as we pull people together, patients, scientists, physicians. And then how do we end up discovering CDGs? And some are very recently discovered, like last week, one week ago, we identified uh, some patients who, <coughs> one of them is a drummer. <laughs> <laughs> As you all know, there yesterday. <laughs> He's hot. So then how do we communicate with multiple families and then interact with doctors, researchers, um, and what accelerates and zooms our programs forward? And the other side is, where do we run into walls? Where do problems develop? So we'll cover all of that different area, and then of course, I'm sure you'll have some questions. So, who are you? Well, that's me. I'm not. I'm not medically trained. I don't. I don't have an MD. I have a sister who's developmentally disabled. She's 64 years old, and I see her at least once a year, and, and we hug and we dance back and forth like that. So I feel very, very comfortable about being with all the whole kids and the families. I mean, this is, this is homecoming. So I've worked on glycosylation disorders and glycosylation as a, as a scientific um, endeavor for about 40 years. And Bobby, stand up, Bobby. I don't want people to recognize <laughs> you. Bobby Ames. Bobby, because you've had an accident, and Bobby has a heart of gold. I mean, he's just wonderful. Not only that, he's an extraordinary scientist. He's got uh, skills that people his age and his experience shouldn't have, but he's got. And so he's really magnificent. He's really our, our main uh, contact in the lab for the families, physicians, and oftentimes other scientists. So we have that, that same sort of heart and brain involvement. So our goals are really to discover new types of CDG and say, well, what's wrong with the old types? I mean, come up with a chop liver. And it's not that. It's that as a basic scientist, you need to show that you're advancing the leading edge of science. And if you're not doing that, other scientists say, well, you're not doing what you ought to be doing. I don't think you deserve a grant. So maybe you have to shut your lab down. We don't want to do that. So we have to be sure that we're always advancing the field, always moving forward, because other scientists will tell us that we're uh, on the mark or not. So, but we understand the basic science that underlies all of these different disorders. And sometimes when we make a discovery of saying, oh, that's really interesting. Nobody ever thought about that before. You know, we can we can go do this experiment, this one, and gets our juices flowing. We don't forget about everybody else, but that enables us to, to get moving in the right direction. But also, all of those things we feel need to make a, a difference for patients. So where do we where do we start this thing? Well, 
DNA sequencing or transparent testing, and most of you have probably had transparent testing, uh, will generate some information, some data. And so families may contact us directly, and you may have been one of those families. Uh, alternatively, physicians will contact us. And sometimes they're almost simultaneous. We'll maybe see about something on a, a Facebook page, maybe uh, something that uh, comes in from a doc or a family will say, you know, we know about you, our doc will be contacting you soon. But if one, it comes in either direction, all of us got to be together. So there is the communication back and forth. That's really important. So what's transparent and, and what's, what's the big deal about this? And I'm going to be technical for just a short amount of time. Transferrin is a protein that runs around in the blood that happens to carry iron. There's a lot of it. It's easy to take a little blood sample. You can probably do it from a drop of blood. And you can do analyses that will tell you if, in general, you have a glycosylation problem. Not everyone, but some. So this is the peak that occurs by a, a method that's not really important. But it has <coughs> two sugar chains on there. And that's not a bowl of lucky charms. Those are really indicating certain changes. So what happens if you're glycogen deficient? Well, you could be missing one of those chains, or you could be missing both of them. And if we see this kind of a pattern, then we're very suspicious there is a CDG in play. Also, you can miss, you can have the loss of just individual sugars. You know, uh, this one called sialic acid or galactose or N-acetylglucosin. It doesn't matter what they are. It means that we can begin to zero in on what the genes might be uh, by looking at the pattern this comes out to, to you. And again, not all uh, types of CDG will, will do this sort of thing. But this is one of our, our entry points. And so we believe that this is maybe not surprising that physicians and, and scientists interact I think they need to interact more. I think more scientists, like yesterday, need to be part of groups that get together with physicians and see <coughs> the problems and the advantages that physicians have. And by, um, by analogy, uh, physicians can then also see some of the issues that basic scientists are facing. But one thing that we insist on, which is really critical, is to involve the families. Now, usually, you know, that relationship goes physicians with families. In this case, we're, as basic scientists, we're getting involved. And we can talk about why, why that's happened. But that's, that's really important to us. So how do we, in general, communicate with um, the families? Well, as I said, families or physicians contact us. So then uh, Bobby will swing into action at that point. So we'll get informed consent. So you know, another one of those forms that you have to sign that allows us to um, get material, which could be either some DNA from the cheek swab or a uh, blood sample, or in some, in some cases, fibroblasts and skin samples. And then we collect all the clinical information, and we evaluate the results in, uh, in the lab. And we say, well, yeah, this looks like a pretty good bet. Maybe we should keep pursuing this. So we'll ask for skin cells, DNA serum from patients. And sometimes we need it from other family members because a hunting down what a mutation may be uh, may be a pretty easy thing. On the other hand, it may take years. And how do we figure out what gene, what mutation is really important? Well, sometimes we do that by knowing what the parents have and then knowing what other unaffected SIBs may have. So if we see this mistake, this genetic abnormality tracking with just the patient or the patients, but not in the, in the SIBs that are healthy, then we have a sense that we have some opportunity and we're zeroing in on the right thing. And that, that's why we need to involve the other family members. And how do we then discover these disorders? Well, we've got the patient samples, and then sometimes we do uh, simple assays in the lab if we have the material. And that material is oftentimes skin cells. So we can do some fairly simple assays if we think that clinical appearance 
uh, may look like something that we uh, have seen before. So we'll sometimes go for that. Uh, there is now a couple different places where your doctor can order what's called a CDG panel. And that just means that all of the known types of CDG, they will do a DNA analysis and look for mistakes in those known types of CDG. And if that looks like a hit, well then they may come to us and say, hey, we, uh, we think this is it, does it make sense to you? And so, you know, we may be involved or, or possibly not. But usually, that, that's where we would normally stop. But if it's unknown, and remember again, we've got to make new discoveries in order to justify our existence uh, as fundamental researchers. I. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, uh, yes. Did I, did I bring you a virus? <laughs> we would blame it on you whether we did or not. <laughs> <laughs> We've done that before. That's right. <laughs> so, so then if it's not known, then we send the trio, that means mom and dad and uh, the, the affected child, to the Center for Mendelian Genomics at the University of Washington, and they do more extensive analysis. And that's where uh, we will then enter in, and Bobby is just really the one carrying this forward. Uh, we'll analyze those results. And sometimes that can take a long time. But I have to say, Bobby has sometimes spent 10 minutes. Is that the record? 10 minutes? Probably less, but yes. Let's <laughs> Do I hear five? Five, 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 five. So Bobby has discovered defects in five minutes. Yes. All right. Uh, he's got a he's got a pipeline to God or something, <laughs> but he's he's quite the guy. All right, so we think we've got something. Now what do we? Do? Well, now we have to show that among all those thousands of variants that are out there in everybody's genome, that it was that one that was really important to cause the defect, and that can take a long time. We have been at some for years, haven't we? <clears throat> okay? Years. I'm sorry, but it's true. And other ones, once we have a, 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 a hit, we can go and do the right experiment and come up with some, an answer in a week. I mean, that's terrific. But that's for diseases that are known. The ones that are unknown, get destroyed. So that can take a long time. Oh, I'll bet I, I'll bet it's a complex slide. I always say, I should not have joke. I'm going to be excited. I'm going to go look that up. So, so Clyde, I just want you to know that any of the families are paying attention because, you know, you just whisper down the road that probably has an unknown mutation. Can you get along? So, we can make it well. Okay. Uh, go ahead and try to, to set that up. But, uh, Oh, okay, great, okay. So how do we interact with, with other doctors and, and researchers? Well, thank God for the internet and, and uh, email and the telephone. Yeah. Thank you, yeah, I always have to say So, but if you find one case, how do you know <coughs> for sure that that's really what's causing the problem? Well, the best way to do it uh, is to find out if there is another lab another researcher who has found a similar patient and maybe a similar uh, sort of uh, mutational analysis. But here's, here's the problem. Everybody wants to be the first. Everybody wants to be It was me. <laughs> but remember, that's how you keep your grants, how you keep your job, how you keep recognition. So you've got to get some credit. If you don't do that, and if everybody else is beating you, you get beat down. I mean, it's a business at that point. On the other hand, you don't care about business. You want results that are going to be meaningful for your child. 
So, in the academic setting where we live and breathe, first to discover, that's that's big deal. If you're second in line, mm. So I keep trying to push for people to have interactions, and as soon as we've got something we're pretty sure about it, we talk to another lab, we try to talk to other people. Sometimes there are labs that are not so willing to share. We know of an example of a disorder that somebody had worked on for over the last couple of years. We knew that this was a deficiency. And that person who was working on this went to visit another lab that does CDG research. And they, the other lab, had a paper in progress where they were reporting on other patients. And there was not a clue, there was not a hint <coughs> that this was coming along, even though this guy had said, here's what we have and here's what we're looking at. The other lab could have said, well, he said, we've got that too. Oh no, had to be first. Let's, let's get together, people. Let's do something that benefits everybody. And the way we can do that, I think, <laughs> is families can be empowered to catalyze that by encouraging researchers to share. We'll try to do our part, but I think that's important. And I'm going to do what I can to move things forward in that area. You're fighting against the system. I mean, it's an entrenched system. Everybody knows how you get cut. You don't get cut. Okay? But we need to bust through that. And at my age, I can say I don't need more credit. It doesn't matter for me. I, it's okay. Somebody else can do all this. But that's got to be uh, you know, shared in some way. And we're going to work on that. I can promise you. Changing times. This is really critical, I think. Uh, a guy across the street from the Center for Burnham Crevice named Eric Topol wrote this book. And it's called The Patient Will See You Now. And the premise of this book is uh, doctors have been solely in charge of your health for millennia. They make the decisions. They are empowered because they're smart and authentic. The people they were treating were not in the same room. Everything's changed. This guy's a cardiologist. Now he's saying because of the internet, because of all of you having gone to Google, I'm sure every last one of you has gone to Google and looked up what is this. And you may go to your doc and say, well, my kid has CDG. <laughs> right? and, you know, and it's not that they're incompetent docs. It's that there's such a, a spread of so many new diseases coming. Everybody can't keep up on everything. So you're partners. You're not people who need to be kept in the dark. You want to know. And doctors are now responding to that, realizing that you are more of a partner. You have information. You have access to things. You wear um, Fitbits. You have different ways that you can monitor uh, your, your child's condition with many, many different ways. So what Eric is saying is that going forward in the future, all these wearable devices, uh, and he was on Stephen Colbert actually demonstrating uh, the nearest hands of Stephen. Um, but, but you can do all these things. So medicine is changing, and everybody is beginning to embrace that. And, and the physicians uh, appreciate the help. I mean, sometimes you can be a pain, I'm sure. The physicians still know more and can make the right kinds of decisions, but sometimes you can provide them with the information that they didn't know about. And you can, you can help them. And they go, ah, okay, well, I, and I called a friend of mine, and he said this, and then she said that, and now what we think we can do is the following. So more communication. I think that's, that's really vital. So what advances or slows our, our progress here? So from my standpoint, from our standpoint in the lab, if we ask you for something, we're not just uh, uh, asking and saying, well, you know, hey, we you get around to it. Uh, give us a call back, do something, we need something. Please do it. Because we don't ask you for things usually unless we've got something that we're going to be actionable. And so if we ask you for something, get yeah. Most people do, but some people uh, kind of take their time on it. Please don't. We're here for you. We're working for you. Uh, you know, but 
you got to punch the time clock too. Come in when when the ads. That helps. And that's true whether it's from the families or physicians. So if you know that we've asked your doctor something, your doctor's not responding, you contact us. And say, hey, what's what's going on? I said, I'm waiting to hear from your doc. Then you go to your doc and you say, excuse me, ma'am, doctor. Have you made contact? No, no, we haven't yet. Well, could you do that, please? You're empowered. Don't forget that. You don't want to be a pain, but you're empowered. So I think that every family should receive updates. And, and, and if you don't get them, ask for periodic updates. I know uh, um, people who have had samples for a couple of years and never report back to the families. That's unconscionable to me. You got you to gotta be in contact. We got to talk. People have to exchange information. And so sometimes even these suspected defects turn out not to be the defects. So you may start off saying, hey, it's this CDG and it's working like this. And then the more we do fundamental research for the patient, the more we may find out that mm, that's not actually the case. So scientific research labs like us, we don't provide a diagnostic service. Uh, you may notice, you know, we never send you a bill because we can't. We're not um, liable and we're not profitable in doing this. This is what we do because it's the right thing to do. But you can imagine how we're trying to balance being helpful with getting our work done of discovering new diseases. So it's always trying to find that balance. So if you need results that, that are actionable, in other words, you want to do family planning based on that, uh, you have to have a licensed lab that will actually verify that. <coughs> so what do we do? Well, we get DNA and transferring, we do the gene sequencing, we coded results, that's Bobby again, and then we'll do all of this. And in the last, uh, what, two years, we've discovered seven new types of CDG. And each one could be a PhD research project going forward. So you can see how very easily it can spread out very quickly. So what have, what's it been like in our lab? Well, we had two, 285 fibroblasts on skin cells. Uh, most of those, uh, uh, we've been involved in that many cases in solving. We have abnormal glycosylation. Many of the gene defects we found were in PMM2, the CDG1A. Uh, whole exome sequencing with the University of Washington, we've done a lot of that. We get about um, over 50% of the cases um, uh, we've solved by whole exome sequencing. And as I said, there's seven new disorders. And over uh, in our career, we've done 18 uh, new disorders that we've either discovered individually or been part of a larger collaboration. So we, we, we want to play our, our part, and I think, I think we do. And, uh, great kudos to Bobby. So it has, as you can see, exploded in the number of disorders that have been discovered. So what are we now? Now we're up to uh, 113. Any, anybody new? 113? Since last week. Not since last week. <laughs> <laughs> so we can see that there's an enormous explosion. Now, in fairness, how can you expect any doctor to keep up with all of those things? Look at the, look from 2010 to 2015, 16. This influx of data, but that's been made possible because of whole exome genome sequencing. So that's going to continue to grow. It doesn't detect uh, transferrin doesn't detect all CDGs, and some are, are alterations in homeostasis. In other words, the balance between making things and breaking them down. And GLI-1 is a good example. We'll hear a lot more about that today. Uh, and even. Um, even, even some predicted that we, you would expect would change transparency sometimes don't. But we don't understand all those things. Again, research has to be there. And as I said, it, the CDGs can disrupt a balance in sort of a whole overall like oscillation pathway. And this is where, uh, you know, it's important as you get clinical information, um, perhaps at the NIH, it's important to have that authenticated information that's done in a routine way, it's important to have that in addition to all the stack of records that you have like that over all the things that you've looked at over the years. You say, well, why do we have to go through this all again? 
because it's going to help us understand those diseases and to put it in a box where we can actually search that box and understand how those, those tests have been done by the same people in the same setting. Consistency is really important. So I'm going to finish off here. Uh, many of you, or some of you, may know this uh, blog. Uh, when I first saw that, I said, oh my god, is he pointing at me? And it turned out he was. <laughs> Hunting down my son's kid. Uh, and Matt had that gun trained right on me, and, he, and that was captivating. Man, you see a picture like that, and that's why it went viral and it got a couple million hits. That's intentional. But he knew the right way to do this. Yeah, but he had lots of ammunition. He ain't that gun in a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but you, but choosing that picture, you feel it's you, that's right? True. And and that was the power of that picture. <clears throat> I'm sure that was well chosen. <laughs> It, it may have been intentional. <laughs> uh, then that, that led to Seth Manukin writing uh, uh, an article in the New Yorker that got a lot of attention uh, about uh, Bertrand and about Grace. So there was, there was a lot of attention that went to that. Uh, just a few weeks after that, uh, there was another article of Deutsch that was published in Der Spiegel, which is the you know the best known uh, periodical in Europe. I mean, it's very well established. They are co-equals, so you know it was a you know wonderful <coughs> punch there for for Engelai one, and eventually that has led to better things. So you can have a well-placed advocate like like Matt. Increase the CDG awareness, and I guess you can say CDG and n one is known at the highest levels. I can't stress enough how important it is to get us in front of people that can make a difference. Larry Tabak, who was our first keynote speaker at uh, the event uh, on, on Friday, uh, wrote me a note and he said, uh, uh, you know, that's Real good reading you had there. It says, uh, let me know the next time you're in town. You and Francis, Francis Collins, <coughs> get you guys together and, and talk more about this. And so I'm hopeful that we'll be able to get things like this rolling, not only from the standpoint of the big man, right, but at different levels where the scientists are coming in, where the families are coming in. I think we've got a great opportunity here. It, it, it's, it's unprecedented. I've been around for a long time. This is as good as it's gotten. So what's important? Advocacy. What you're all doing. Education. And that means education for physicians and scientists, families, and those big decision makers. That interaction, all the alliances of all the stakeholders is cooperation. So we've got to support fundamental discovery research because that is what creates the hope for the future and the possibilities of us coming up with things that we never perhaps even imagined before. Now we may have a chance to do that. So keep up the great work, and we are here to help you.